Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Stats All Day with Dr. O'Day. Hi everyone, Connor O'Day here helping you to understand what an independent samples t-test is, how to run that independent samples t-test in Jamovi, and how to understand what you see when you actually go forward and run that, and then also how to report that in a APA format results section. So an independent samples t-test, what that's doing with any t-test, we're comparing two groups. So with a one sample t-test, we're comparing our one group to a known population mean or a known criterion of some level. A paired samples t-test, repeated measures t-test, what we're doing is we're, we're taking measurements at two time points and comparing participants change from time one to time two. Now in an independent samples t-test, what we're doing is we're actually comparing two different groups now, and people are in only one of those two groups. So there are two groups, um, each participant, it hopefully gets randomly assigned. So random assignment, what that means is that participants have an equal likelihood of getting placed into one of those two groups. Now we can't always do that, such as situations where we're running a quasi-experimental design, but hopefully participants are getting randomly assigned, but the key here for running an independent samples t-test is that participants are in one and only one of those groups, and we're comparing the averages to one another. So the degrees of freedom are going to be a little bit different here for an independent samples t-test, because now there's degrees of freedom for each group. So degrees of freedom for group 1 is going to be n1 minus 1, and we're going to just add that to the degrees of freedom for group 2, which is n2 minus 1, or a more simple formula, just n1 plus n2 minus 2 to get that degrees of freedom. So an example of when we might be running an independent samples t-test, one situation that a lot of people might be able to understand is when we're comparing a test drug to a placebo. Another situation might be when we want to know people's perceptions of different memes because, you know, hostile and sexist memes are getting shared all the time on social media right now. Um, and those often take the form of hostile sexism or benevolently sexist memes. Um, benevolently sexist, if you aren't familiar with that, what that means is that people are believing that women, for example, cannot do things that men can do, need protection, need to hold the door open for a woman, those types of things. And generally what we see in this line of research is that hostile memes are perceived as significantly more effective than, more offensive than benevolent memes. And so what we're seeing here is that there are these two groups. We're showing one group the hostile memes, we're showing the other group the benevolent memes. We can also manipulate, say, in a study examining perceptions of people discussing diversity. Um, so oftentimes people don't feel comfortable having conversations about diversity, and in some of my own research, I've actually manipulated the race of a researcher as black or white, and then asked people to discuss diversity initiatives with that black or the white researcher, and we've examined people's comfort level. One thing to keep in mind is our dependent variable in a t-test is still going to be um, continuous. Um, and this is part of the assumptions of the general linear model here that we're working with a continuous variable. So real quick, I'm going to show you the study that we're going to be analyzing here. So in this study, we manipulated um, whether a child was a boy or a girl. Um, so first we have Liam, then we also had um, uh, Emma was the other one in this situation and so Liam is described as a healthy six-year-old boy who goes to a specific elementary school we have the um, the name of the school blacked out to get people to think that we're actually you know putting this information in there but hiding the names um, so to get them think that this is more realistic here and Liam's teacher describes Liam as someone who's doing quite well however Liam doesn't tend to play in ways that are typical of most other boys his age. In the, in the young girl condition, um, Emma was described as not playing in ways that are consistent with a young girl. Um, and then we manipulated how the parents responded after that parent-teacher conference. So we um, had the parents either affirm the behavior um, by saying that it's completely fine to Liam, or they backlash Liam for the behavior, saying that his behavior is not appropriate, 
or we had a control condition in which they um, you know just listened to the teacher and made a plan together and then we didn't actually specifically say how the parents responded so in this situation I'm going to get rid of the control condition for the purposes of running this t-test because again a t-test only uses two groups so we're going to compare the affirmation to the backlash and we're also not going to look at the gender of the child in this particular example so here's our data file here um, what, what we're seeing is that um, this is Jamovi, by the way, and if you aren't familiar with Jamovi, um, it's a fantastic software, and I'm going to go in, I'm going to post another video on why it's an awesome software, how to get it, and, and kind of what it does. You're going to see here that I have a filter instilled. This is removing just that control condition there. So we are comparing just the participants who saw the affirmation to the participants who saw the backlash condition. And we have a bunch of different dependent variables here. So we have parent competence, we've got parent likeability, we've got child likeability, etc. Um, so when we go forward and run an independent samples t-test, we're just going to click analyses right here at the top. We're going to click t-test. And since there are two groups and participants are in one and only one of the groups because it's a between groups design, we'll click an independent samples t-test. I'm going to move condition over to the grouping variable. So your grouping variable is your predictor variable in this study. And the t-test is going to report students t. That's what we use here. And let's measure or let's examine parent competence as our outcome or our dependent variable. So right away, Jamovi is awesome in that it shows you the test statistic right away. So it's giving you your t-statistic, and the way that we interpret this is as your t-statistic is increasing, the p-value is going to decrease, and once your p-value crosses 0 0.05, that's when we're going to go ahead and say that this is a significant effect. So what we're seeing here, and typically we start to see significance for t-values around 2 to 2.5, this is a pretty large t-value. The degrees of freedom are going to be the, um, the, the total number of participants minus two. Um, so there were actually 115 participants who were in these two conditions. And then we see the p-value is less than 0 .001. So what this is telling us is that this is significant. So this t-value is significant. Now, one of the things that we could do is we could also ask for the mean difference. So we could actually see what is the difference between my two means. But I actually prefer to ask for the descriptives because then I can actually see that, that parents who affirm their child for gender deviant behavior are perceived an average of 7.93 on a 1 to 9 scale with higher levels meaning more competence. So participants are perceiving the affirmation condition is significantly more competent than the backlash condition. In fact, the affirmation condition is perceived quite positively, while the backlash condition is perceived quite negatively. We can also ask for a measure of effect size, so this actually gives you a gauge of how large that effect is. And the one that's going to give you by default is Cohen's D. It's a fantastic measure of effect size, showing us um, how many standard deviations larger one of those groups is than the other. And because we know that the affirmation condition is higher, this Cohen's D is saying that the affirmation condition is 2.88 standard deviations higher than the backlash condition. We can also ask for a descriptive plot. That's always nice so that you can actually just see, you know, this is where um, the affirmation condition is falling up near 8 and then this is where the backlash condition is falling a, um, a little bit lower and you can kind of see the spread of data around those. Um, we can also ask for our confidence interval. So this is going to be a confidence interval um, for the difference between those two means. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to say that we are 95 percent confident that the difference between those two means is going to be somewhere between 3.94 and 5.10 in that population. Now one of the things that we could have done is I actually ran this as a um, two-tailed t-test. So let's actually talk through um, exactly what's happening when we're running that one or two-tailed t-test. So our hypotheses here, we might, the null hypothesis is always just that mean 1 is equal to mean 2 in the population. And we're using mu here that signifies a population mean for group 1 is equal to the population mean of group 2. So the null hypothesis, again, is saying that there's no significant difference. 
Now the alternative hypothesis is actually going to be um, a, we're going to make a prediction that's against this null hypothesis. So it's actually suggesting that there is an effect. And this, in this case, mu1 is not equal to mu2. Now if that's just my prediction that I just want to test, are they significantly different? I would run this as a one tail or a two-tailed test. However, if I had specific predictions about the directionality, maybe I thought that participants in the affirmation condition would be perceived as significantly more competent than, uh, than parents in the backlash condition, I might run a one-tailed t-test. And what that's going to do is it's going to make my test more powerful. So if we come back to our data file here, I can actually, so this first one is if I'm just testing, is there a significant difference? But if I had theoretical rationale going into the study saying that the affirmation condition should be significantly greater than the backlash condition, I could actually click this button and run it as a one-tailed test. In which case, not very much is changing. The test statistic is still the exact same. However, what's happened is, is the critical region the level at which the p-value crosses the 0 0.05 criterion has now shifted. Now we're not going to see that because in both cases the p-value is less than 0 0.005. However, what's happening here is that this p-value is actually going to be significantly lower than this original p-value. So now if we want to go ahead and report these effects we can come back here and what I would say is for a results section I might say something like parents who backlash their child were perceived as significantly less competent than parents who affirm their child for gender deviant behavior so here what you can see is first off we always want to give the reader the values that you're comparing we always want to tell the reader the mean and the standard deviation of each of our groups we also want to give the reader the T statistic that we just found. And the way that we format this is that it's going to be lowercase, it's going to be italicized, and it's butted right up against the parentheses. Sometimes it might appear like there is a space there, but there's actually no space there. The T is right up against the parentheses. We can also give the reader our degrees of freedom, and again, this would indicate that there was n minus two degrees of freedom, or I mean n minus, yeah, so n minus two degrees of freedom, so there were 115 people in this study in those two conditions. We give them our actual t-statistic, which was 15.4, which we had just found. We then give participants the p-value and the Cohen's d, which are lowercase and italicized. We take the significance level or the p-value out to three decimal places. Now, if the p-value is less than 0 0.001, we always need to put that less than symbol. And so it's never p is equal to 0 0.001, it's p is less than 0 0.01. And I actually need to delete the equal sign there. I apologize about that. But what that is, is p is less than 0 0.001 we can also give a 95% confidence interval for that effect. And then when we report these, we always want to make sure that we put spaces around all equal signs or that less than sign. And this is going to be really important. It makes things aesthetically pleasing. It makes it a little bit easier to understand and read. Some rules of thumb when we're reporting these that you can keep in mind is that everything except p-values gets rounded to two decimal places. So you're going to see that I rounded our mean and standard deviation to two decimal places, whereas the p-value I took out to three decimal places. And that's because if a p-value, say we have a p-value of, say, 0 0.054 and a p-value of 0 0.048, Technically, both of those would round to p is equal to 0 0.05. Now, the issue there is we don't know whether this one or this one are now significant because they both round to 0 0.05. Is it less than or is it greater than 0 0.05? So that's why we always take these out to three decimal places so that we can actually see are those significant or not. Another rule of thumb is that all non-Greek letters should get italicized. So your T, your P, the D, the F, the B, etc. when you start reporting those other ones in more complex stats. And then all Greek letters do not get italicized. This includes eta, alpha, rho, beta, etc. So I hope you learned something. Um, I've enjoyed this, so have a great rest of your day, and let me know if you have any other questions.